Hello everyone and welcome back to COS, our course on commercial open source startups. We are now starting the second of three parts and it has four lectures in which I will introduce open source and discuss commercial open source strategies based on this. In this first of four lectures, we will look at open source software, the artifact, and how it came about. So open source software started as free software and by all practical means and purposes, free software and open source software mean the same, which is why they're also sometimes called FOSS or FLOSS, free and open source software or free, libre and open source software. The term free software was coined by the Free Software Foundation and the term open source software was coined later by the Open Source Initiative. The definition is very similar and basically both organizations say software becomes free software or open source software if the user is given the right to use the software for free, to study it, to modify it, so you need source code for that and then pass on the software uh, without any payment or other restrictions. And if you have a software license that fulfills these requirements, then it is an open source, a free software license or an open source software license in spirit. And if it also has passed review by, say, the Open Source Initiative, then it will also, in, also semi-officially be an open source license. Open source then is first of all software, but we often use the term just open source and that could mean different things. So beyond the software, the actual artifact, uh, you sometimes talk about an open source project. That usually means the software and the associated project community or the associated community of developers and users who cater to the software. So when we say project, we mean both the software and the community. There's also an open source product, which companies sometimes uh, provide. So that would be a commercial product utilizing an open source strategy. Please note, given how important I think it is that you understand the difference between project and product, that project here is not a project in a classical sense of something with a start date and an end date. It's a pretty bad misnomer, but it has stuck because an open source project is just a community undertaking. There is no set end date. In fact, it just keeps on going. So it really should not have been called a project, but what can you do? Here are some examples um, of open source software, some of which you may know well, the Apache Web Server or uh, the Eclipse IDE or uh, GIMP or Python, the programming language, OpenOffice, LibreOffice and so forth. So open source software is in widespread use, as you know, and uh, really a big success story. So open source software was not the first software arguably to exist because it was only formalized what that actually is in the 90s or if it was free software a little bit earlier. Software uh, before then actually didn't even exist for the longest time as its own legal or logical entity. Um, only with uh, the uh, recognition by the authorities, by the courts of software as something that can be separated from, uh, from hardware. Did software uh, become its own thing, intellectual property, as previously discussed? And while initially it was given available, given away as something of little value for free, because the value was supposedly the hardware, that eventually changed and companies started closing uh, the software and did not provide source code. This upset one particular person, Richard Stallman, so badly uh, when he couldn't help himself. That's the story. When there was a bug in his printer because he had, didn't have access to the source code any longer, that he 
argued all software shall be free, meaning available in source code form. That's the four freedoms that define free software uh, a couple of slides back. Now he set up the first uh, or one of the early open source licenses, the GNU public license, but also the BSD licenses, which are early licenses, and invented something known as copyleft, a particular obligation that comes with software that we will address in, in a few minutes. Uh, after the initial philosophical debates on can we make all software free, can we free all source code, um, uh, most folks decided that this is just too philosophical. For practical purposes, we just want to collaborate and the open source initiative was founded with a substantially higher pragmatism in dealing with open source than uh, free software and the Free Software Foundation. Projects started growing in numbers, so many more open source projects came about and the number of licensees, meaning those software licensees that turned some piece of software into an open source software also kept growing. In the Nordis, the uh, professionalization of open source took place by the first, uh, in my counting, the second generation of open source companies, which um, created and earned a living from open source projects that they either serviced or that they uh, brought to market themselves, something we will discuss in later lectures because that would be commercial open source. And today, since 2010, roughly, open source is so significantly mainstream that it has um, entered pretty much everything, continues its strong growth, is easily accessible, increasingly companies know how to handle it, and um, these days it's just pretty much everywhere. To avoid some confusion, I need to pull forward one particular concept because most likely you always have an examples in mind and might get confused if what I explain don't, doesn't fit. Uh, and the key distinction is really between community open source and commercial open source when you look at some piece of open source software. It is either community open source or commercial open source. And the difference is that community open source is indeed software, then open source software that is developed by a broad community of stakeholders. So many different uh, parties. The communities usually talk about committer diversity and hence nobody, no single entity owns the software. As a consequence, there is an open source license for the software, the artifact, and the ownership of that artifact is widely, widely shared because many different people contributed. Um, even if there's an open source license, it does not mean that people lose their copyright. So there are owners, they just made uh, the software available for free under an open source license, but it's many different parties. And then also for a community open source uh, project, uh, there is open governance, meaning people, capable people can contribute, uh, can have a say. The people who steer the project are diverse again uh, for that in the sense of different stakeholders, not a single party. And that is very different from commercial open source, as we will see later. Uh, here, the artifact, the software, is owned by a company which chooses to make the software available for free on an open source license and thereby forgoes their exclusion right, at least for those parts that they make available for free. But the company stays the owner of the software. So students often know something like MongoDB or Elastic, and these are commercial open source software uh, products. And uh, even if they build on Apache projects, which would be community open source. And then not only does the company own the software and does not really share, let anyone share in the copyright, 
they also manage the process so they will not let anyone outside determine the project uh, the product roadmap and so forth so there is no open governance uh, no open process in which everyone can take partake you can use the software for free on an open source license but you cannot contribute uh, or um, if you contribute you'll have to transfer your rights to the company and it's important to understand that and we will revisit that so here's some examples um, community open source could be traditional open source projects like GIMP or Blender it could be um, and it also is usually developer-led projects often now under the guidance of a foundation like Jakarta or the uh, by the uh, with the Eclipse Foundation now and uh, or it could be user-led projects which are usually uh, applications also guided by foundations like the Quali software for uh, running universities so developer-led projects here mean components infrastructure components that are used to build products and user-led projects usually are applications that people use like they come uh, contrast that with commercial open source where there is a single company which owns the software that might be a mongodb um, or where it is an open source distribution like uh, SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, and uh, that would be a commercial open distribution, open distribution and a corresponding company. And then there are also service and support firms. So let's look at open source licenses now as the key part of the definition of open source uh, or what makes software open source. Again, a software becomes open source if it's provided to you under an open source license. And here are the five parts, uh, five components of uh, what makes an open source license. An open source license usually has a copyright notice, not necessarily, but usually has a copyright notice by which the original copyright holder puts down who they were, who programmed this. Then follows the rights grant and uh, the rights grant spells out these rights of free use uh, to receive in source code form, modify it, pass it on, modified or unmodified, and still it's free. Then there are often obligations to fulfill. Actually, uh, usually there, not usually, there are almost always obligations to fulfill, uh, like providing to users this license uh, itself that they uh, of the open source component you're using. Sometimes there are prohibitions like don't use the trademark of the original license creator. So the Apache software license does not give you the right to use Apache, the Apache trademark and so forth. And most certainly there's always a disclaimer which says that uh, you, uh, that you have no rights to sue the original open source programmer or at least they disclaim all warranties or representations no guarantees use at your own risk and such licenses can be short they don't have to be complex legalese so here is the MIT license where you can see the um, copyright uh, placeholder where a user of the MIT license who applies it to their source code is supposed to put their copyright so copyright 2021 by Dirk Riele would be one thing to do and that is the copyright part then follows the rights grant to permission is granted free of charge and so forth that's the good part that's the rights the user uh, gets uh, free free use of high quality often software number three is the obligations that are put on anyone who uses uh, the software and here we need to read carefully it's just one sentence but even that sentence is already challenging um, the above copyright notice and this permission notice shall be included in all copies or substantial portions of the software so what's being defined here is you can copy the software so you can you receive a copy but then you can also pass on the copy if you pass on open source software that you received under this license then 
you must provide, must include in that passed on software, the copyright notice and this permission notice. The permission notice is the license you see here. So not only can you, you can use the software, obviously you can put any MIT license code into your product, but if you do so and give that give your product, including the MIT license open source code, to a customer, for example, then you must also provide the copyright notice and this license text. Easy enough, one might think, but challenging in practice. Then the prohibitions are missing here. Um, MIT obviously thought that you would not be silly enough to think you can use the MIT trademark if you use the MIT license. And number five then is the disclaimer where the developer of some open source software who chooses to use the MIT license for their code uh, disclaims any warranties. Now, implied in the obligations you just saw was a distinction between two use cases of the software. Um, if you do not pass on the open source code and you're just using it for your own purpose, like if you download Firefox and use Firefox, then you're just using Firefox, you're not passing it on. That is what I call in-house use here. You're really just using the software. That could be personal use. But if you're a vendor, it could also be demos to customers because you're just showing stuff to customers. You're not giving them code. Um, and uh, that would be in-house use. It also applies, for example, so it's generally applications that you use, like um, LibreOffice or OpenOffice. But such applications can also be development tools like the GCC compiler, the GNU C compiler or so. And as long as you use that in-house, the obligations of passing on, for example, with the MIT license, of passing on copyright notice and license text do not apply. But if you pass on the open source code to a third party, you receive it, you're the second party, and then you pass it on to a third party, then you are performing what's called a distribution. You pass on the binary of source code, and that is the second use case, and that comes with the obligations like providing license text and copyright notices. And these are all already the most common obligations um, that you should create uh, legal notices as you pass on software, a product uh, to your customers, for example, and there will not be just one open source component, there will be hundreds for each of those. Uh, you have to provide the license tags and the copyright notice is called provide attribution here and the disclaimers, hopefully it's not just one piece, one text for a particular component and some other things as well. Uh, the most common ones are copyright notice, attribution and license text. Some licenses are called copyleft licenses and that refers to a specific clause that is present in those licenses which requires that you pass on the code uh, that you received only under that copyleft license. Um, even if you modified it and added to it and that's your code, uh, you can only combine it with copyleft license code if you apply the copyleft license to your code. And uh, that is something that vendors often don't like. Here you can see a model of what's happening. So you can see uh, the original open source programmer P, who decides that some intellectual property they own, code they wrote, uh, that they want to license it out to the world under an open source license. So hence comes a vendor, a company, D here for distributor, who takes the open source code of the programmer and puts it into a product, for example. And because it's a vendor, they sell their product to a customer, uh, here called user, um, and hence the user then receives from the vendor D uh, a product which includes open source components. The original distribution is when the programmer gives the vendor the code and the redistribution is when the vendor gives the user or customer their code. Now look at what happens with 
open source code that's included in the product that the vendor creates. If the open source code is so-called permissively licensed, like under the MIT license, uh, which is a so-called permissive license, then you can relicense. The license, the MIT license, as I showed you, does not prevent you from using that code in your product and selling the whole product under your own license. So combining MIT license code with a proprietary code allows you, or the MIT license simply allows you to relicense or use a license of your choosing, uh, like a commercial license. You still have to fulfill the obligations for that part of your product, which is the original MIT licensed code. But there is no copyleft effect uh, affecting uh, your source code. Now, if you use source code that is open source code that's covered by a copyleft license, like the GNU public license version 2, GPLv2 here, then the copyleft clause obligation of that license requires that as you combine your proprietary code with said GPLv2 licensed code, you can only pass, you only have the right to pass it on uh, with the agreement of the original developer if, you're, if the combined code of your proprietary code and the open source code is also licensed under the GPL version 2 code uh, license. Hence, you cannot put a proprietary license on it and hence um, your commercial use is limited because you cannot use your own commercial uh, license and the GPL v2 of course like all open source licenses says free uh, free to use so um, you cannot make uh, money long term and in fact all your open all your source code has to be laid open so this copyleft obligation was so upsetting to many vendors who did not want to be forced into into um, licensing out with a non-commercial license like the copyleft license. Uh, this obligation is so important that people use it to structure different open source licenses into categories. The key is the permissive licenses defined by they do not include a copyleft obligation. And then there are the copyleft licenses which contain a copyleft obligation and then there's a difference between weak and strong copyleft licenses where weak means uh, the copyleft effect only applies if you modify the original uh, uh, code while the strong copyleft uh, effect applies to all the code it touches so even if you don't change the original libraries just use them the copyleft license will affect your code that uses the library. And the GPL version 2 specifically as the most prominent copyleft license uh, got a head start, was there very early through Stallman at the Free Software Foundation and only 10 years ago was uh, half of all open source code was licensed under this license. Now that has changed drastically over the course of the last 10 years. The MIT license um, has grown significantly and uh, in general permissive licenses, those licenses without a copyleft effect have grown strongly. Uh, the change in market share from the left to the right from 2009 to 2019 that you see here is um, in absolute numbers. So it also implies that if 10 years later, MIT went from 3% uh, to 30% that the total amount of open source code must have grown significantly because um, this is not the first derivative, this is an absolute numbers. And so whatever 50% market share meant in 2009, that code is still around. And so we see two things here, lots of new open source code and just almost exclusively all new open source code is permissively licensed as seen by the growth of the permissive licenses 
and the decline of the copyleft licenses. There are 50, 60 different licenses uh, known, 20 are used often, um, there are some retired licenses. In a software project or product, they often get combined, so you need to see how they fit into categories and how you can combine things. You can combine a public domain code, which is no license really with everything, but uh, from permissive licenses, you can only relicense to copyleft licenses or stronger permissive licenses. In general, you can only accept more obligations. And uh, that's why you move from left to right as you combine things. If everyone were ever to combine, uh, eventually everything would end up in the rightmost corner, the most strongest, the strongest uh, copyleft license there is right now the Afero GPL version 3. However, as we will see, companies don't like that, at least software companies don't like that, vendors don't like that, so they make sure that their code does not get combined with copyleft licenses. So um, for a long time, Microsoft succeeded in uh, frightening other software companies and the public uh, about open source, calling it a threat to intellectual property, um, calling copyleft licenses viral licenses, because like a virus, that license would affect, infect um, your program code, your intellectual property, and require that you lay it open and give it to customers, after which you would have no business, etc. And Microsoft has come around. Yeah? They are a big time user and contributor to open source these days and stop the inflammatory rhetoric. But um, uh, nevertheless, um, nevertheless, uh, copyleft licenses are of course around and need to be taken care of. So um, companies who use open source in their projects and products and who wouldn't because it's often high quality software available for free uh, really need to get a handle on how they use open source in their products and that is a challenge because it's not just one small component companies are using it's really a huge amount of open source code that makes it into products these days so here you can see an illustration of uh, how you might be a software vendor who has a product and now you're using components, libraries, um, some of which you might source from suppliers, uh, closed source components. So someone sells you a library for cryptography or something and you use that. Uh, but you will also most likely these days use open source components uh, from the web. So the product, the architects behind the products, they know uh, what code they are using. Um, Third-party libraries from which are either open source libraries or closed source libraries from other companies. It's called the supply chain. So they open source so software developers, software companies do think about these components they use as coming out of a software supply chain. And when you look at it, you recognize that the supply chain is not just one level deep. It's only the one, one level that the architect sees because or the developer sees because they care about the functionality they get uh, from programming against an API. But uh, all these libraries you use or they use have further dependencies. And so you have to drill down and see that there's a second and a third and a fourth level or tier of libraries that get pulled in just because you use a particular library at the top. Um, it still looks harmless here, but it can actually be really deep. Uh, so even a trivial project that does almost nothing easily pulls in a hundred or more libraries uh, to just start up uh, the system, say hello world and shut down. So open source comes like all source code comes with uh, deep dependencies. How much? Well, here's an example. So you can see a Mercedes-Benz, a car, 
think this is from 1996 so five years ago when you bought this car you would get this DVD and you would get uh, information about the open source components that are doing their job in mostly the infotainment system of the car so the center console that's where most of the software was back then in the car well, still is and um, uh, the what you can see here so what's on that dvd is uh, seen to the right to the right you can see the table of contents of a pdf that's on that dvd and these are the the form of presenting the legal notices that i talked about meaning the license text and the copyright notices and some other notices that the licensees of the open source code doing their job in these in this car's infotainment system require of the distributor here Mercedes-Benz uh, as they give their product including the open source code to customers the product may be a car but it still contains open source code that is being given to users so Mercedes did the right thing and created those legal notices and as you might recognize that's 1500 pages um, uh, then a four I assume that's a huge PDF uh, that was really laborious to assemble so uh, people spend a lot of time of creating this PDF from the license texts and the copyright notices of the code in the infotainment system or in the car in general you may also see how there's a jump at where it says GNU GPL version 2 so uh, most likely that big jump is uh, well the GNU license text which is certainly isn't 1100 pages but the um, the uh, copyright notices uh, of most likely a Linux kernel doing its job here because the Linux kernel is comparatively large uh, compared with these other licenses so assembling legal notices like this is a lot of uh, can be a lot of uh, work certainly as software grows larger there are more and more of these notices to create and it's not like you could just shake your head and say who cares well if you're an open source programmer and uh, you contribute something to Bluetooth software and well, the car uses Bluetooth, maybe your code is doing its job. So if only one copyright notice is omitted, uh, then there's only one person who cares perhaps, but that person might care deeply that they are not getting the credit uh, for their work. They are not expecting money. It's open source, they contributed to, but certainly this credit and being able to tell your friends or grandchildren uh, that you wrote code that's riding around in that car uh, might be important to you and if it's not there you might be upset and well maybe even you decide to sue uh, uh, Mercedes because they did not observe the licenses this PDF you just saw of 1500 pages um, I don't actually like how it is presented because it was structured by license it would be much better to structure the legal notices that have to come with each product that uses open source uh, if you structure the legal notices by component so that users can look up which component are which open source components are included in this product and then what's the license of that open source component and what are the copyright notices and whatever other notices there might be a good example or an example done right is are the legal notices the open source notices on, on an Android device so here you can see some, um, you, you can see the screenshots from an Android mobile phone left you can see the open source part you click on that then you get an inventory or a table of contents of components and then you can click on the component and you jump to exactly the notices for that component so now third panel bzip2 and there you find the license and the copyright notices and so forth i think that's a better way the top level of such legal notices are than what mercedes did the top level of the legal notices should be structured by 
the components, not by the licenses, unless you deliberately want to confuse uh, readers. Now, again, you may wonder if that is so much work, is it really worth doing it? Well, it depends. Um, first of all, it, uh, if you want to be correct and conform to the licenses and not risk any lawsuits, then you should do it. But will anyone ever discover? And that is actually where open source becomes a risk management issue. You will never have perfect legal notices for various reasons that uh, I can get into at some other point of time. But how likely if there is and there will be mistakes, how likely are people to find out about incorrect legal notices? Well, um, here are some pointers how much you might be at risk depending on your product. Um, consumer products are more likely to uh, get into the hands of people who uh, will be upset simply because uh, consumers as private parties um, might be upset. Yeah? Uh, enterprises don't really care so much. They don't go after other enterprises, usually of open source violations, but a disgruntled open source programmer might. Low price makes it easier to get your hand on a device or a piece of software. Um, if it is very expensive, then you will never find out because you never get a hand, never get to touch it. No private person uh, will buy a Siemens Healthineer CT uh, um, uh, tomography, computer tomography, and put it into the living room because that's just way too expensive. So low price like a router or so, home router for your network, that's where there is some risk. Uh, also embedded, so you actually get a physical device uh, rather than you just use a service in the cloud. And of course, uh, if there's copyleft license code, there might be people who are more interested in enforcing licenses than with permissive licenses where people may be more relaxed. So uh, cheap physical device, consumer space and copyleft, that's the uh, highest risk category. Now, we just learned that uh, there are some risks and that you need to create those legal licenses, legal notices, and that maybe you don't want a copyleft license code in your uh, products that you build on open source. And whatever your particular requirements, you need to have companies need to develop processes to enforce those requirements. Before there was any such so-called governance, where well, governance is the set of processes and practices to ensure you get what you want here. Um, in companies, people might just have used open source as they see fit, ignoring the consequences. And of course, companies can't have that any longer because of the risks that I just uh, illustrated. So now companies who are at the state of the art uh, have open source governance uh, where they uh, make sure that only open source components of licenses they like, where they think they can handle the dependency on that component and the component isn't taking a left turn or something that they don't want and so forth, uh, where only such components are included in products or used in-house. This is usually the job or the mandate for ensuring this is given to the so-called open source program office. That's a new org unit or sometimes just a single overloaded person who has the job of defining what is allowed, managing that and so forth. This is really something that today any well-run company has or must have and it's not a well-run company if it doesn't. Even universities have such governance rules because universities also have intellectual property to protect. Here are some common things you might find in the rules, governance rules for open source uh, code in products. If you work for Siemens or SAP, they have rules like that. And perhaps the most important, a couple of very obvious ones that everyone has, which would be like do not copy open source code randomly into your projects or your product. 
just don't. Um, certainly never strip the license. Um, always keep any licensing information with the code. And of course, undesired licenses, uh, meaning code provided under undesired licenses, should never be copied into your code base uh, with the license information or not. Code without a license that you might find on GitHub is proprietary code, so you have no rights to it. Even if it's publicly visible, uh, you still have no rights to it. It's proprietary. Copyleft license code is often not wanted because of the copyleft effect. Perhaps, uh, well, not necessarily a well-known example, but a dangerous example is Stack Overflow, where the code that you find there is copyleft licensed. And of course, full Stack Overflow programmers love copying code from Stack Overflow. And hence, you just copied copyleft licensed code into your code base. And you really shouldn't, because it might come out. And then uh, you have to... Um, comply with the licenses. Well, if complying with the licenses works for you, then it's not a problem, but usually it does not work for you because in my example here, software vendors generally avoid copyleft license code altogether. Um, so copying small pieces of code is one thing. Using whole full-blown libraries is another one. Um, the libraries come as their own package, so you don't copy them into your own files. You really just declare them as a dependency and use them. But even there, you shouldn't, most governance rules say, you should simply not declare a dependency in a copyleft licensed library. That may be harder to ensure than you might think, because what you include, the dependency you declare, might say it's an MIT licensed library, but uh, maybe that's not true. Um, maybe that's just the label, but the code actually is a copyleft license. Or that MIT licensed library pulls in other libraries, they are deep in their own dependencies. So two levels, three levels deep into your software supply chain, suddenly you are, are fished in your phishing net or in your dependency graph as a copyleft licensed library. and you don't want that, so you need to find that out and then not use the library that comes with that other copyleft licensed library. Finally, you need to watch out that you don't get contradictions between the licenses. Sometimes they contradict. And then you get a so then you get a situation where there is no legal use possible. What you should do, or what's the common recommendation, is often only use permissively licensed open source components. Only MIT, Apache, BSD, licensed libraries, and so forth. Also, uh, since that's possibly just a label and you're never so sure about the actual content, do not go bottom fishing in places that are unsanitary. Only go and use projects and code from places with good governance. So GitHub in general is uh, no, no, forbidden, unless it's specific places that have a high reputation like the Google or Facebook repositories or some others. Or you just use the open source foundations. Um, we will talk about those code and then it might be fine. In any case, you absolutely need to track what is in your product so that you can create the legal notices. That is a lot of information for most developers, more than they can stomach or want to know about. So you need to make it easy for developers to uh, make an early decision on whether something is possibly good for their product or project or not. And usually they have to still run it by the open source program office. Can I use this library? Yes or no but uh, you obviously don't want them to bring you a lot of libraries where, the, where you have to say no. So you want to inform them about what's likely to go through and what's likely to be rejected. And a simple way of doing it is to provide lists like this, where you list those projects that are allowed, those projects where you must ask, because it really depends on how it's going to be used, and then projects that are not allowed at all ever and you could do this again by projects you could do this by licenses because there are too many projects to be listed here 
you could choose licenses that are allowed or where you must ask or there's an immediate denial and you might also apply that to sources of uh, where you could get them from uh, which are cleared like the Apache, West, Apache Software Foundation website um, where you must ask or where it's absolutely a no-go like uh, Stack Overflow. So I hope uh, with all these problems I did not uh, uh, I hit the benefits of using open source. I'm simply assuming everyone knows how sensible it is to use high quality open source components that are for free, that are standard, uh, standard compliant, that are uh, avoid vendor lock-in and so forth. There's so many reasons why you should use open source that uh, this should not be forgotten now that I'm talking about all these problems that you need to deal with. So you get all these benefits of using open source, but there are costs and not even open source is free. The costs are organizational capabilities and so forth, like having good governance and not paying some other vendor, but uh, they are nevertheless uh, costs. So as you're using open source software, um, you need sad governance, all right. But even then, if uh, a library that you wanted to use passes, uh, passes muster, is of a license that you like, then there are still potential problems that require monitoring the open source component. Um, specifically, uh, you need to make sure that the IP uh, of the code you're using is really clean. Again, just because it says MIT on the outside doesn't mean there is not copyleft license code in there. You hope it's all MIT and if the developers were proper, then it is MIT, but you never know. So that's why you also need to look at the heritage or the lineage and where does it come from and so forth. You can use so-called uh, snippet matches to identify the sources of the actual code in a given library. Another big topic is uh, security vulnerabilities. So any open source code eventually has vulnerabilities that are discovered and then get fixed. So you need to monitor your use of open source components for any vulnerabilities that become known. And as you do that, uh, you learn about vulnerabilities and then you know yeah, now you need to possibly fix your products, which could be quite a challenge if your product is driving around there on four wheels and doesn't have an internet connection. Also, uh, software keeps evolving and you need to update your software. So by using open source components, you really create a technical dependency on that component. And if suddenly that component is not available on Linux any longer, meaning new versions are only available on Windows, then you have a problem and you need to take uh, countermeasures because if it's not maintained any longer, then again, security vulnerabilities might pop up, but also just new functionality isn't being developed and you're looking at a dead end component and so forth. So um, what about these problems? So ensuring clean intellectual property really means that you need to take an in-depth look at the software you want to use, the open source software that you want to use. You really need to analyze it in detail. If you have a high need of being sure that the code is clean and that there is no uh, nothing in that code that would be a liability to you later. Liabilities in code, again, are an undesired license, but also patents, of course, and certainly also, but that's a separate issue, vulnerabilities. Here is um, uh, an overview or a screenshot from Sonatype, provider of Maven, Maven Central, um, on the use of Java components and they found that a substantial number of applications or users who build systems recognizable by them through users pulling down components from Maven Central pull down components which have severe security vulnerabilities. 
So many developers do often do not update the dependencies, do not monitor that the old version of a component they are using, that maybe they have fixed with a version number in the build system, the build files, make files, Gradle files, POMs, whatever, um, that these have known vulnerabilities. And it's a real challenge and they really should know but uh, they need to developers need to monitor that these vulnerabilities have become uh, known for the software finally um, if you're actually building a business then there are other intellectual property issues to consider for example the use of the trademark um, if you like to sell services for i don't know uh, Nagios, some, some data center monitoring tool, and uh, Nagios won't let you use their trademark any longer, then you cannot provide services for Nagios any longer, any longer because you're not allowed to use that name because it's not your trademark. So what actually often happens in that case, if there is someone who owns a trademark and is obnoxious enough to, um, to, to the users, that they might then they might fork the open source code so open source programmers always have the opportunity of taking a copy of the open source code and developing it further by themselves that doesn't give them access to the trademark they have to come up with a new name and remove all occurrences of the original trademarks um, but uh, then they are free to use the code and continue developing it under the license that they got it from so if it's a copyleft license, then they are stuck with that. But if it's not a copyleft license, they may be allowed to relicense uh, more freely. So until now, I talked about um, problems with using open source, things that you need to monitor, things that could go wrong. And I will now uh, turn this around um, actually, I won't turn it around, but I will now take an adversarial stance and assume that you are using open source components, but there's someone else uh, who might try to control this other software, the open source software, and that would also be a problem for you. So how is it possible to control open source software? Well, there are actually many different ways of how you could do that. Um, there is the hard control by way of intellectual property and then there are software social leadership uh, forms of controlling open source software. Now if it's open source software there are certain rights like free use that are given to users uh, and you can't take that away. So you cannot retroactively revoke an open source license if you're the copyright holder. Um, but if you are the copyright holder, you can do other things. And of course, software keeps evolving. So you don't want to be stuck with, uh, stuck with the old version. The, if there is a single or, or those who own the copyright to a software, um, if they can act as one, which would be the case if there is only one, uh, then they can actually change the license going forward. Just because an old version is licensed under MIT doesn't mean that a new license might not be available exclusively under a GPL, GPL version 2 license, or a commercial license only. If you're the owner, you can relicense your code and put all new code exclusively under that license. Again, you cannot retroactively change it, but New code, the evolving code, the updates, the bug fixes, all of that could be exclusively under a new license. Again, I already mentioned that if there's a trademark attached to the software, even embedded in the software by logos and texts and so forth, then um, the implied or explicit grant that may have been given to you for using the trademark, that may actually be revoked. And so that is a common thing that there's a trademark owner who is to some extent quiet um, or has a defined license that is very permissive, but then changes their tune and threatens to charge you for it. 
uh, threatens to withdraw the trademark. That's when the forks of the projects happen. Uh, then there are, of course, uh, patent trolls, meaning companies who own patents or simply there are patent owners. And if the source code in the open source project implements a patent, then the owners of that patent might come after you and might charge you license fees or simply forbid you to use the software if that was their, their goal. You can also um, be cut off from reaching an audience if you are, say, servicing an open source software. If someone else owns the domains, the media, the marketing channels by way of an open source foundation, some of which we will cover later. Also, if you're just a user, uh, you embed an open source component in your product, um, then and you're not active uh, in the project, then those leading the project might take the project into a direction you don't like. It's their power as social leaders and uh, um, to take the community and lead the community into a direction that you may not like. It's not a, a black or white thing. It happens over time. But clearly, software can be led in a way that may not fit your needs. Again, uh, the community might decide to stop supporting the Linux version or the Windows version of the software. Equally, if you actually want to contribute, but have no commit rights, you're just a committer, uh, just a contributor. Any contribution you might make might get rejected um, or might get delayed. Um, and that is another way of how the copyright owners who also own the domains and so forth might manage or put people at a disadvantage if they provide updates only with a time delay, do not accept your contribution. So if you they accept your contributions only do so by acquiring copyright from you and so forth. So there are many ways of how you can be disadvantaged and at the mercy of the people leading, socially leading the project. So with that, I gave you a quick overview of open source software, the artifact, how it's defined by open source licenses and their properties. Uh, specifically the copyleft property or obligation which many vendors don't really like which is why they set up good open source governance to rein in whatever might happen uh, through developers incorporating code and then some problems uh, and things to deal with when you're using and incorporating open source in your projects and products are uh, things to think about with that thank you very much for your time and attention and in the next session, we will look at open source project communities and open source foundations. See you then.